morning, everyone. Have you ever encountered a person whose presence overwhelms people in the space? It could be their profound teaching in a soft voice or excellent performance in music or acting or any other forms of art. And their presence brings great joy or enlightenment for many people. And today, Pastor Chris will invite us to continue our journey with Jesus, whose presence makes huge differences in people's lives, in love and compassion wherever He goes. So let us open our hearts and continue our journey together in great joy and hope. Oh, 
out of the refrigerator at least 30 minutes before you do this because you want it at room temperature. Also, you're gonna need some water, measuring cups, a large bowl, half a cup of table salt, there, uh, three cups, and a spoon to transfer the eggs between cups and to stir things up. Into the large bowl, pour one and a half cups of water. So add your salt and stir it up. While Molly continues to stir, we're going to add another cup of water to our bowl and keep stirring until it's all dissolved. This might take a few minutes. Fill the first cup with regular old water. The next step is to gently place the egg into the cup. And what happened? It just sinks. Sinks straight to the bottom. We're going to fill this cup with the salt water solution we make. Now we're going to use our spoon to transfer the egg from the plain water to the salt water. You get the egg. Okay. Now let's see what happens. What happened? It's loading. Very carefully. I'm going to pour this cup about halfway with the salt water. That's good. And we'll put the egg in. Okay. Let's see what happens. It floats. It yeah. floats. Now what happens when we start to add regular old water? And what happens? It stays in the middle. Right, it floated, but only about halfway. So the egg floated or sunk based on the density of the solution. So this week, Pastor Chris and Scripture teach us about why people respected Jesus in his day. And it was often because he did not just speak with authority, but more importantly, he led by his actions, showing us all how performing good works based on his teachings can lead to good things. In our experiment, each molecule of salt led to a greater density of salt in the solution. And with the increasing density, the salt, the egg was lifted further up. Likewise, with each good act we perform, the density of good acts in the world increases and we are all lifted up. We can be good leaders like Jesus showing everyone around us how we can lift each other up. So, how can you lead by example this week and lift up those around you? Think about it, talk about it with your family, and as always, we'll, we'll see, see you next week. week. I'm playing with this. Thank you for joining our worship today in Haddonfield United Methodist Church. We welcome you as you are, and I'm so glad we can continue our journey together to embody the love of Christ in the world. 
Look, we, we know following Jesus is not a momentary event, but a lifelong journey to nurture the relationships with God and with others day by day. And I hope we can help you to find the meaningful connections and relationships in our small group ministries. Especially a con connected group is a small group gathering around the Connected Guide, which is our small group discussion guide following the weekly sermon theme. So we offer connect groups not only Sunday but throughout the week weekdays. So please check out all our small groups information on our website at headofieldumc.org slash small groups and let us know if you are interested in any of them at office at headofieldumc.org. Also, I want to invite you to start your day with a new inspiration by reading or listening to our daily reflections. More than 20 contributors share God's stories in their lives during the week. And you can find all the information, all the resources we provide in our website, headonfieldumc.org, under Resources tab or headonfieldumc mobile app. God continues to call us as a partner for God's greater story in and beyond our community. And Food Drive helps us to bring food security for many families in need in this season. And we work with our mission partner, Cherry Hill Food Pantry for now. And you can drop off non-perishable food items or other, needed, other items that you can see at the bottom on the screen in the Church Breezeway anytime. Thank you for your giving today. And I know your giving is the expression of your faith and your giving makes us keep moving forward. So I encourage you to be a part of a greater story in your give, generous giving. You can give online at headonfieldemc.org slash give or headonfieldemc mobile app or mail a check to the church to, to the address below. So let us continue to worship our God who is good and who is generous always to us. The living word of God given us today is Mark, chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Have you ever been in the presence of someone who blew you away with their talent or something that they had to offer that went beyond your expectation? In 2006, I had the privilege of being in the worship band of the United Methodist Women's Assembly in Anaheim, California. We were there hosting the event for a week at an arena with 10,000 people present. One day we had just finished a worship service and the band were exiting the stage because the speakers were coming on, and it was Don and Emily Sailors. Don Sailors at the time was a professor of theology at Candler Seminary, and Emily Sailors, his daughter, is a member of the very famous group Indigo Girls. They had just written a book called A Song to Sing, A Life to Live, and they were coming out with another book called Music and Theology, in which they were going to be talking about um, tying together folk music and sacred music and theology and how we experience God and the gift of music. And I remember sitting behind stage with the band, watching them and listening to the talk, and it was intriguing and it was interesting, and they played some music together. And then at one moment, Don, the father, sat down and Emily got up with her Martin D35 guitar. I can remember and I can picture it. And I wasn't even paying attention at the time. She started to play 
And she began to sing, and the song was building and building, and whatever I was doing in that moment, I stopped and I looked up, and her voice began to swell in a way that it took over the entire arena. Before I knew it, I had tears streaming down my face. Something about her spirit and her transcendent voice and her playing was so honed and so powerful. Whatever words she was singing, I don't know. Whatever song she was performing, I have no idea. But I was blown away. When they finished their lecture and their set of songs, they got off the stage. I wanted to meet them, but I didn't want to run after them. And it actually was a great coincidence that Don left his glasses on the piano on the stage. So I ran and grabbed the glasses and got to run and follow him. And I wanted to meet them because of the power of her presence and her voice. It just cut to my soul. And I think of the psalm that says, deep speaks to deep. The arts can do this. Even human presence can do this, particularly when it hones in on the needs of the heart, of love, and human compassion. Jesus was one such person whose presence cut to the quick of a soul. He didn't need someone to announce his arrival or even for people to read his resume to understand he was important or powerful. But Jesus commanded both authority and wielded power by something inside and within. In the Gospel of Mark, early in the Gospel, still in the first chapter, there's a story where Jesus is teaching in the synagogue, and it says that people were amazed by how he taught. He didn't teach like the scribes or interpret like the Pharisees, the religi religious leaders of the time, but instead it says he did so of having greater authority. Where did his authority come from? It didn't come like them, coming from the right tribe or the right family, inheriting the lineage of a scribe or Pharisee. We don't know what rabbi he, he studied with. We don't know what school he went to. But instead, Jesus' authority came from somewhere else, an inner th authority that wasn't conferred like that of human leaders were of the scribes. Instead, Jesus taught in a way that made the scriptures, the Torah, and the prophets come alive. People wanted to know the God that Jesus knew. People wanted to be in his presence because of something within him. And while he was teaching in the synagogue with great authority, it says a man came in, caused a stir, began to yell and scream and disrupted things, probably scared people out of their minds. Imagine if you were in church and someone came in shouting. Today, we would worry about violence. We would worry about uh, someone harm, being harmed. And I imagine that their people were trying to figure out how to get that man out of the synagogue as quickly as possible. But instead of hiding behind uh, the, the podium or a seat, Jesus instead stepped toward the man. And it says that he called the spirit, the unclean spirit, out of him and said, leave him. And screaming and yelling and thrashing around, the man fell to the ground and the spirit says, holy one of God, and Jesus named it and called it out. You see, the spirit is called unclean. If we understand the Torah, being unclean means that you really shouldn't be in the presence of God or of others. Ritual purity is really important to being in God's presence. Because if you're defiled by something that you eat, or defiled by something that you do, or if you touch a dead body or blood, if you are defiled, you are not worthy to be in God's presence. So this man should not have been in the synagogue. And not only was he not worthy to be there, he also could have contaminated the other people. Just like if someone walks into a room with hands full of mud, they can make everyone around them dirty. 
And so ritual purity is seen in the same way. But Jesus didn't worry about his own cleanness. Jesus worried about the man. He had compassion. He had a concern for the man more than he had a concern for the synagogue. And so he stepped to the man and said, be out of him. Again, the story ends the same way that it started. People were blown away. Who is this man? How is it that he teaches a new teaching and does it with a new authority? As the gospel compares Jesus to the scribes multiple times, I think about not only where they get their authority, kind of like where humans get our authority today. Think of an authority in a field, whether whatever it may be, health or disease control or even communication. I'm looking at a camera, an authority in, in video production is someone who has great experience, who went to the right schools, who studied with the right teachers. But from what we know in the Gospels, Jesus had none of that. It was a different kind of authority that came from a different place. And so he didn't need to prove it. He wasn't interested in showing people his resume or his last name or anything. His authority came from the only place that mattered to him, that God had called him, sent him, and was present with him. And people felt it. Just like I felt in, in that moment when Emily sang, I felt something different, an authority within that voice and that music. People felt a difference in Jesus' presence and authority. But more importantly, it was the power that he wielded in that situation and in his ministry. If I think about again in comparison with the scribes and the Pharisees and the priests of the day, their power was usually a power of influence and a power of punishment. If people didn't do what they taught them to do, they would be threatened of punishment, of damnation, or being cast out from the community, or not allowed to come and to be within the synagogue or in the temple. There was a power of fear and a power of punishment and a power of intimidation. I would refer to that as a destructive power. Not that it destroys on its face, but that kind of power can, can tear at the fabric of trust, of respect, and of relationship. Usually when someone has power of fear, of intimidation, or of punishment over us, we don't love that person, but we respect them because we fear them. But Jesus' power was a creative power. It was a constructive power that built trust that built admiration, that built respect, and most of all, built love, particularly through the lens of deep compassion. Anytime Jesus saw the crowds who followed him when he traveled in the Gospels, the crowds got larger and larger, and many times it says he saw the people and he had compassion on them. He didn't seek to get something from them. He didn't seek to threaten them to do what he wanted. He didn't uh, uh, have power that came from, uh, from access to uh, influence. He didn't have power from money. He didn't have power that came from a governmental position or military might. But instead, Jesus' power is the power to dispel ugliness through love and compassion. It was to dispel by channeling God's presence and what God was doing in him. One thing that I have been particularly convicted of over the last year, and especially now as we move into this year, is this difference between being concerned about labels and categories of belief and that of being disciples of Jesus Christ. If you watched the sermon last week, you know that I touched on the difference between being believers and being followers. Now, Jesus, of course, did talk about belief in God and belief in himself. But what Jesus invited people most of all, the rich young ruler, his disciples, and others, was to follow him, to walk with him, to learn from him. And in a sense, they would have had access to his creative power, the power to build up and to create, not to drive away, not to break down, not to fight fire with fire, 
to enforce violence over violence, not a power of hatred or of revenge, but instead a constructive power that rebuilt relationships that had been destroyed, that forgave people who were unforgivable, that reconciled that which seemed to be broken forever, and to bring back to life that which was written off for dead. If we think about the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis, it begins by saying, in the beginning of creation, God created. God's power from the very first word in the first book of the Bible is a power to create something from nothing. In the beginning, the Gospel of John says, in the beginning was the word. Let there be light, right? Jesus being the word, a constructive power to create, to build up. And when, when we offer the constructive and creative power of love, of compassion, and forgiveness, the ugliness of humanity can be driven out. But it's not driven out by its means. It's not violence that drives out violence. Because as we know, violence only begets violence. It becomes a cycle. We win today only to lose tomorrow. But instead, Jesus' ministry on this earth and now ministry through us as his followers and disciples is one that is driven to build up, to love. And only by doing this, by loving our enemies, by forgiving people who have harmed us, to model grace for people who really don't even deserve it. That is the type of power that is going to turn things around. And that's the type of power that's going to turn broken churches around. That's the type of power that can heal stretched relationships and broken families. That's the type of power that can even speak to our own deep, deeply punctured, wounded hearts. But just like Jesus' authority didn't come from humans, that power doesn't ever come from us. We don't own it. We only have access to it when we invoke the name and the presence of Jesus Christ. And that's why it's important to follow Jesus, because Jesus is always on the move, taking us not to places of prosperity or of power or of human influence, but taking us to broken places, to difficult moments, and to face our greatest fears. Let me talk about that word for a moment. Fear. It is one of the most powerful motivators that I know of in this world. Fear is used everywhere right now, on one side and the other. Secular forces, religious forces, people who are adamant that they are right and people who are adamant that they have a right to avenge their being wronged. Fear is incredibly powerful, but fear is only destructive. The letter of 1 John in chapter 4, verse 18, has these beautiful words. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. There is no fear in love but perfect love casts out fear. Jesus led his disciples in the face of danger many times. His own cousin was put to death by a king for crossing him. Jesus himself was arrested and was put to death, but never did the fear of human authority or human power of violence, of hatred, of anger, of revenge, it never scared Jesus away because he possessed creative power. Dear friends, I'm often driven and even paralyzed by fear. Fear of a pandemic, fear of financial distress, fear of the degrading of social fabric, fear of people judging or disapproving. But Jesus is the one who leads. And Jesus is the one that calls me not to get it right or to think all the right things at all the times 
but Jesus gives me access to a power greater than my own. And it is the power to walk forward and create a new way, a new pathway, a future with hope, even when we think that the future is doomed. Dear friends and beloved followers of Jesus Christ, the good news this day is that Jesus' authority comes from God, and God's presence is with whoever gathers in the name of Jesus. But hang on, it's not a standstill affair. Jesus is on the move. He said, we never know where the Spirit is coming from or is going, and it will lead us in difficult and perilous places. But the power of Jesus always calls us to create new life, to create new pathways, and to believe that there is a future even when it seems to be doomed. Think about this week, my dear friends, how you might step one step forward in the face of fear, or in the face of concern, the face of uncertainty, the face of people who might offer you harsh judgment, or hatred, or resentment, and not give them the same back but give them what Jesus gave the crowds and even the unclean spirit, compassion, forgiveness, and love. For you, my dear friend, are loved and are forgiven by God to so let us go and offer it to this broken and hurting world, knowing it will be redeemed by the power of Jesus, our Christ. Amen. So dear friends, in the name of God who has created, in the name of God who has redeemed all things, and in the name of God who sustains us, may we be sent forward in love. May we find our own healing, and may we find a vision for the world and for our own relationships 
that is not paralyzed by fear, but helps us to walk forward one step at a time in the name of Jesus Christ. Let us go in peace and let us go and be hope. Amen.